that Matthew 22 in the Word of God this morning, Matthew chapter 22, and it is a privilege to be here today. I mentioned our family has grown, other things have changed. I have a new toy that I have to carry with me just about everywhere I go if I want to see anything. And so uh, I am into the reader stage of life, and many of you are there, and if you're not, you'll get there one day, Lord willing, all right? But uh, God is good. My arm did not go long enough, and so I got these, all right? And uh, Matthew chapter 22, let's open up in prayer. Father, we love you, Lord. Thank you. We can sing praises to your name today, gather in your house with your people. And Lord, if there's one here that doesn't know you as Savior, I pray that today they would come to know you as Savior. God, speak to our hearts through your word as The pastor mentioned, if you don't speak to our hearts, then nothing will be accomplished today. It's no good that I could say or do that would change a life, but your word can change us. And I pray that whatever you want done, God, that it would be done today. And we'll thank you and praise you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In the word of God, we are commanded to do a lot of things. And uh, our topic for this morning is the fact and, and, and subject of this, we're commanded in God's word to love. We are commanded in God's word to love. Look, if you would, Matthew chapter 22 and verse number 34. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, Pharisees and Sadducees were opposed to each other and they were gathered together, actually joined together to come against Jesus Christ. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Notice this is the first and great commandment. They came to Jesus Christ and they said, What's the greatest commandment? They're trying to test him. See if he knows. Jesus said the greatest commandment centers around love, and it's this, you need to love God with all that you have. They asked what the greatest commandment was. Jesus went on like some preachers do and said, well, hang on, let me give you this. You ever hear a preacher say, I'm going to throw this in for free. How many of you heard that before, right? They asked the greatest commandment, and the answer was, thou shalt love God. And then he said this, but wait, but wait, the second is like unto it, verse 39, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. They didn't ask for the second, but he gave it to them. And then he said this, notice, powerful statement. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? What's the most important thing? He said to love God. But also, you think about this, to love your neighbor. And then when he says, and on these two things, hang all the law and the prophets. This is pretty important stuff that our Savior is talking about. God puts a major, major emphasis on loving God and loving your neighbor. Loving God should be an easy thing. I hope loving your neighbor is an easy thing. I don't know who your neighbor is physically at your home, but even those amongst us today are our neighbors and we're to love each other. In Luke chapter six, and for time's sake, we won't go there, but we know scripture teaches us this and Jesus teaching says this, you are to love your enemies and do good unto them which hate you. Well, that's a little tougher. Church, love God, and we would say amen. Love your neighbor, amen. Love your enemy, oh my. But that's what our Savior said. Do good to them that hate you. In Ephesians 5, we spoke about it last night. Husbands, we're told to love our wife. And we ought to do that, all right? She puts up with you. And uh, husbands are to love their wives. And it's so important that we do that. In Titus chapter 2 and This has always kind of bothered me a little bit. In Titus 2, the Bible says this, that the aged women, the women that are a little more senior, should teach the young women to love their husbands. 
And I'm thinking, really? You have to go to a class to figure out how to love us? It takes training. You know what I mean? Husbands, love your wives. It's pretty natural. You ought to do that. Yeah. But hang on. We've got a course, ladies. Meet with us. We're going to teach. The aged women will teach you how to love this guy, right? And I'm thinking, man, we're that bad, guys, right? But uh, hey, wives are told to love your husbands and your children. Amen. God says a lot about love. Look, if you would, John 13. John 13. Would you turn to that passage? In John chapter 13 and verse number 33, John 13 and verse number 33. 33 is my favorite number. I grew up, I was a Tony Dorsett fan. Young people say, no idea. All right. Old people say, yeah, I know him. And maybe you liked him or not. That has nothing to do with the sermon. But we're in verse 33. All right. Little children, John 13, 33. Notice this. Little children, Jesus speaking. Yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you. Jesus is basically saying to them, I'm going to die. Where I'm going, you can't come. Right? They never really caught on to that too well, did they? When you're getting ready to die and you're speaking to someone because you're going to die and leave them, the words you're getting ready to say are pretty important. And Jesus said, I have to leave. And as I leave and you stay down here, notice this, a new commandment I give unto you. That ye love one another as I have loved you. That ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. We're talking about love this morning. And Jesus, our Savior, said this. I'm leaving. I'm going to heaven. You're staying here. And the thing that is going to tell this world that you're a follower of me is love. He did not say when they see you going to church on a Sunday morning, they'll know that you're a follower of me. And I am all for going to church. They did not say if they see you carrying a Bible, surely they'll know you're a follower of me. And I'm for carrying Bibles. He did not say uh, when you put on your church clothes, your Sunday best, they'll know you're a follower of Christ. And, and I'm, not, I'm not against getting dressed up for church. Or when you hand them a little pamphlet that we call tracts, then surely they'll know. He said this, when they see your love, they will know that you are a follower of me. Jesus, what are the great, what's the great commandment? Love God, love your neighbor. And we're told to love and he's leaving and he says, guys, you're staying here. And when they see your love, they'll know that you are a follower of me. I do believe this church, our God may put a greater emphasis on love than maybe what we do. I'm for doctrine. I'm for church attendance. I'm for all of it. But our Savior said at the top of the list, it is love that matters most. Too many Christians have what we call the understood love mentality, the age old joke. I've been hearing it since I was a boy. The couple is with the pastor meeting and they're having marriage counseling. And the wife says, my husband, pastor, does not tell me that he loves me. And the husband says, sweetheart, I told you when we got married that I loved you and I would let you know if that ever changes. Right. And uh, some of us have that mentality. It's inside. I just don't say it. Right. Listen, man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. Man cannot look into the hearts of you and your family and this church family and see love. Man can only see evidences of your love that are on the outward. And we would call them expressions of love. In the North, we have a reputation. I'm from the Philadelphia area, as Pastor mentioned. He said to me today, it's funny, we enjoyed Philadelphia. He's like, those people are kind of rough, though. In the North, we have the reputation for being a little cold. Not, not temperature-wise, but, but not the kindest people. He said, yeah, your, your people at the Eagles game threw snowballs at Santa Claus. I'm like, yeah, we did that, right? 
And, and, and if the light turns green, it, it takes like a nanosecond and people are on the horns behind you. And it's like, what, what's your problem, right? And uh, we don't, we're not known for Southern hospitality. We have a friend, John, here, and he's from the Pinehurst area in North Carolina. True story, we're actually there shopping. And uh, the one day I'm just there and going through the little village there and this girl walks up to me and goes, hello, sir. And I'm thinking, why are you talking to me? <laughs> I had a green shirt on that day. She's like, I love that green shirt. And really, I'm thinking, there's something wrong with this child, <laughs> right? In the North, if someone walks up to you where we're from, in a grocery store, whatever it might be, and starts to speak to you, no lie, people grab their wallet and just walk away. It, it's, it's like, who, who, this person's talking to me. But I go down South, and we're driving down the street with my friends, and they're waving at people. I'm like, who's that? They're like, I don't know. I'm like, you just waved at someone you don't know? They're like, yeah, you don't. I'm like, no, no, we don't do that. Hey, where we're from, we have the reputation, if you would, at sometimes being cold. Can I say this? Many churches have the reputation of being cold. They say in the first few minutes, turn to 1 Thessalonians, if you would. In the first few minutes, people decide whether or not they'll ever come back to your church, right? 1 Thessalonians, go there just in scripture, and, uh, and I'm going to give you a few points here this morning, and then we'll go home. But um, 1 Thessalonians, the church at Thessalonica was a real church, right? And they had a great reputation when it came to love. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, look at this, verse number 9. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9. But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And listen to Paul's praise for this church, verse 10. And indeed, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. And then he said this, but we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. Paul said to this church, hey, I don't have to talk to you about love. God does that. And actually, you're doing a good job. But hey, I just encourage you, do even better. And I think this is a loving church, but let me encourage you this morning, maybe we could do better. I hope you have a loving family, but maybe we could do better. Turn just a page, if you would, 2 Thessalonians 1. 2 Thessalonians 1, a little bit to the right there, verse number 2 and 3. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, look at this, and the charity, charity is love and action. Charity is a love that's being shown. Look at what it says about this church. The charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. Wow. They were in a church where he said, you guys just show love to each other in an amazing way. It's abounding. How great is that? Doesn't our God say this in 1 Corinthians 13, that if everything we do is not bathed in love or driven by love, it amounts to nothing. Though I bestow, 1 Corinthians 13, all my goods to feed the poor and have not charity, profit me nothing. Though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. God says a lot about charity about love, about our need to show love. When I leave, guys, listen, you're staying back. Here's the job. Show love to people. And that is the thing that's going to tell them that you are a follower of me, a follower of me. Again, man cannot see inside. It has to be expressed. When the kids were young, sometimes we'd say this as we're driving down the road. We'd say, OK, guys, let's do this. Kayla, Michael, Travis, Kayla, I want you to tell me two things about your brothers that you appreciate. And they're like, oh, no, here we driving in the car. And you know what we said? Let's express some things that we appreciate. Sometimes when we try to express things, it gets awkward. It gets awkward. Folks, listen to me. Sometimes expressing love can be awkward, but we need to do it. Let me give you a few things this morning. Ready? Number one, we can express our love, number one, by what we say, by what we say. And this morning, you know what? Maybe God would revive our hearts, not just about loving one another. We would say we do that, but about actually expressing our love by what we say. In John chapter 21, and for time's sake today, I'm just going to give you the scripture. You can look them up later if you want. This is where Peter said, the Lord said to Peter, lovest thou me? 
And Jesus was asking Peter if Peter loved him. Now, whenever Jesus asks you a question, it's a rhetorical question because he already knows the answer, right? And he says, hey, Peter, do you love me? Lord, I love you. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Peter, do you love me? And three times Jesus asked Peter if he loved the Lord. And three times Peter said yes. Did Jesus already know it? Yes. Why did he ask them? Because he wanted him to say it. And Peter said, Lord, I love you. I grew up in a home where I thank God it was very natural to say, I love you in our home. This is a family emphasis day. Listen, I hope that's true of your home. But if it's not, can I say this to you? You need to break that cycle and change that. And people in your home and people in this church need to express and tell people that they love them. My dad, I don't know why it was, but teenagers can get weird at times. And every day, good night, Mike, I love you. And I'd say, good night, Dad, I love you. And I don't know why I got weird, but I got weird. Teenage years. Good night, Mike, I love you. I said, good night, Dad. He was actually out in the hallway. I was in my room. My door was shut. He said, good night, Mike, I love you. And I said, you too. <laughs> I couldn't get it out. Next thing I know, my door opens and the light floods into my room and dad walks over to my bed and he says, I said, I love you. And I said, I love you too, dad. You know what he was doing? He didn't want that wall building up between us to where it was awkward or, 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 or not, not what we did on a regular basis. And he wanted me to say, he didn't question my love, but he wanted to hear it. And thank God for that. And can I tell you, there are people that you love, watch me, and they need to hear it. Amen. They need to hear it. It could be a grandma, a grandpa, a Sunday school teacher, a friend. It could be someone, listen to me, we don't, we, we understand it, but watch me, it, it needs to be expressed. It needs to be expressed. We had a lady, Carla and I were visiting her not long ago, and, and we were visiting her, and her father was in the hospital. She was in her 50s. She went in and saw her dad in the room, then came out and met us in the hallway. Tears flowing down her face, and she said this to us. She's in her 50s. She said, my dad just told me that he loved me. She said, I only remember that happening once in my life. And her dad was on his deathbed, literally. Hey, tell the people that you love that you love them, and tell them while you have them. Amen. We don't have people forever. We have a guy that works for us. His name is Brother Ed. He actually pastors over in Philadelphia. And uh, he comes in during the week and works in our Christian school. And he had one of those flat hats on, like not a regular base. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know what they're called, but you could tell me. But tell me afterwards. And I said, that's a cool hat. He said, it was my dad's. He's like, I miss him. You know what? He can't tell his dad that he loves him. But the people that you have today, tell them. Well, I'm just not that guy. It's not the way it was in our house. Change it. Change it. Say it with a note. Say it with a text. Say it with a phone call. Say it to their face. If you love someone, tell them. Amen. We can express our love by what we say. Peter, do you love me? Lord, I love you. Can I say this to you? We can express our love by what we do. What we do. In Matthew chapter 26, and again, we're not looking at these scriptures for time's sake today, we have the woman with the alabaster box. Oh, why are we wasting this money on the Lord? And Jesus said, hey, you have the poor with you always, but not me always. And Jesus said, leave her alone. It was very costly. And she, he said, she has done this for my burial. Leave her alone. And then he said this about the woman with the alabaster box. This deed that she has done will be for a memorial unto her. Amen. Think about that. What did Jesus say? A memorial is something that we remember. Am I right? He said what she has done will be remembered. Folks, it is 2024. We are in Cleveland, Ohio, regionally anyway. Brooklyn or Cleveland? Brooklyn? Yeah. Think about that. Think, do you think this dear woman 2,000 years ago ever dreamed 
that when she broke that box and what she was doing was expressing her love for the Savior. Do you think her expression of love that she thought her expression of love would ever be being talked about today in Brooklyn, Ohio, 2000 years from the point she did that? Not a chance. Not a chance. You say, what are you talking about, Mike? We can express our love by what we say, but we can express our love by what we do. And here's my point. People do not forget what you do for them. People do not forget what you do for them. I preached a camp in Salisbury, Maryland, and it was a teen camp. And I remember that week there was a hard of hearing girl there at the camp and someone interpreted for her, but she could hear pretty well. The one day we were in the dining hall and I was sitting next to this young lady and we could communicate. And my mom used to interpret. So I know a little sign language and we were talking and I asked her this. I said, have you ever watched the series Sue Thomas? And I don't know if it was private I or FBI, but it was EYE. And Sue Thomas was a real person, hard of hearing. And they hired her to stake out with binoculars and read people's lips and then give that information to the law enforcement. It was actually a wholesome, good, cool show. She's like, I've never heard of that. And Sue Thomas was hard of hearing, spoke with a little speech impediment. And I got, I said to Carla, I'm like, find someone, get that girl's address. And we sent that series, thank God for Amazon, to her house. And that girl got done camp that week and went back to her house. And you know what was waiting for her? That television series, Sue Thomas. If we bumped into that girl today, Pastor Pete, if you said to her, tell me what Mike preached that week at camp. I'm not sure she would remember. But if you said, do you, do you know him? Do you remember him? I guarantee you she would say, you're the one who sent those DVDs to my house. Because people don't forget what you do for them. My son Michael was standing up here singing bass, and when we stood on the side, he held up his... his uh, diabetic, what is that thing? What would we call it? Glucose meter, whatever. And, and he, he was dropping, his sugar was dropping. And uh, if it drops too low, it gets scary because he says crazy things, all right? But, but he was back there and I was watching that drop. Michael's a type one diabetic. We have a landscaper in our church and when the storms come in, he often hires the young guys. Michael at the time was 16 years old and he hires the guys from our church, the young men, the teenagers to go shovel through the night. And uh, I remember Michael, teenage years, wanting to make money, strong guy, athlete, all of that. His sugar numbers were through the roof. They were just way up. And I'm like, Mike, you can't go out all night and try to work in this storm. It's, it's not good for your health. It's, it wouldn't be right. And come on, Dad, I want, I'll be fine. I'm like, no. And as a parent, your heart breaks when your children aren't well. I'm like, no, you can't do it. But dad, I want to make some money. I'm like, Mike, you can't. So he didn't go. He called and said, hey, I can't go. That's fine. We went through it. I thought nothing of it. A few weeks later, I went to Mike's room. And I noticed there was a letter there on Mike's dresser. And it was not from the landscaper who owned the company, but from the, one of the guys who worked that night. And it said, Michael... You never complain about your diabetes. And I know you wanted to work and couldn't. Here's the money you would have made had you worked. I'm proud of you. Keep on. Love, Gio. Giovanni's just a young man that goes to our church. I read that note, and as a dad, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Listen, we don't buy our friends that's not what makes him a friend. He did that because he is a friend. And when we do things for people and actually express the love we have for them, listen to me, they don't forget it. They don't forget it. There will never be a day that we walk up to, to Michael and I said, do you, do you remember Giovanni? No, I don't remember him. Forever, that expression of love will be remembered. Can I say this? We can express our love by what we say, by what we do. We can also express our love by showing affection, 
by showing affection. In John 21, we have the guy we know in scriptures as John the Beloved. I love the fact that Jesus loved everyone. Luke, he's the smart guy. He's the doctor, right? Peter, he's the guy that wouldn't shut up. Always put his foot in his mouth. And some of us can relate to that, right? Everybody's going to deny you. I'm not going to die. He rebuked Jesus. I mean, come on, Peter. What are you doing, right? And uh, Peter's just that guy. John is called the beloved. John was the hugger. He was the one that leaned on Jesus. Jesus, I love you, right? And he just, he just wanted to be the guy that expressed his love. Listen to me. Men are not tough because they don't show affection. You know what I mean? I'm a man. I don't show affection. No, 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 no. We ought to love each other. And I'm talking about in all bounds being proper. We ought to show affection. Hug your kids. Hug your wife. Love people. I, I got the guys in my church. I give them man hugs. Brother Pete, strong handshake. Pull me in. Beat them on the back. You know what I mean? It's like, man, I, I love you, right? I care about you. We have a pastor in, in Philadelphia. His name is Pastor Penichetti. He's about yay big, super, super Italian. He's got one finger that won't straighten out, so he's like this, right? We call him the Godfather, right? And I mean, he's, he's there in inner city Philly building incredible work. Every time he see hair slick back, just like you would think, I'm telling you. He sees me, Michael, how you doing, babe? <laughs> Grabs my face with his bent finger, turns it to the side, kisses me right on the cheek. I love you. Tell mom I love her. Tell dad I love him. I love you. Right. And he goes on. I'm thinking, man, thank God he's not Russian. All right. He would have kissed me right in the mouth. I'm not doing that. Right. I'm not doing that. Every time Pastor Penichetti sees me, I know I'm getting a kiss on the cheek. That's just what he does. Right. And people hug you and, and, and show love. Listen to me. It, study the statistics of young people. And again, we live in such a twisted world. It's 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 hard. I'm talking about what is right Children who are not shown affection affects their development. We need to hug people. We need to love people. And I'm talking about being appropriate. The, the, the men with the men and, and, and not at the back of the church, you know, pastor hugging every woman. We're not talking about that. We're talking about where it's right. And that's what way, the way we need to do. That is, that is a good thing. That is a good thing. You could be driving down the road. Reach out and take your wife's hand. And say nothing out of your mouth, but communicate to her, I love you, simply by showing affection. John was that, was that hugger. We're almost done. We can express our love by what we say, by what we do, by showing affection. And we need to. And by the way, I still hug my dad. We left for this trip. Dad's 78. He had been in Canada preaching, and we're like ships in the night. And uh, he actually lives on the lower level of our house, separate entrance, apartment, all of that. Mom and then dad in their senior years. He came up. I love you. Be careful. I'm getting a hug every time. And he still gives me a kiss on the cheek. And I know some people are like, My, I would love that, Mike. That's foreign in our home. It may be awkward. But listen to me. Change that. Change that. I wouldn't trade that for anything in the world. Number four, we can also show our love by giving time and attention. By giving time and attention, my mind goes to, and again, mark these verses to Luke chapter 10, verse 38, and around there, it's the story of Mary and Martha. Oh, Martha was busy, wasn't she? Running around and serving, and we've got to get ready, and we've got to get busy, but Mary chose that good part. You say, what was it that Mary did? She stopped and gave Jesus her time. We sing a song, our family, I want to be merry for a while. You ever get so busy you don't take time for the people that you love? Life's clicking by. The sand is going through that hourglass. Mary knew Jesus is here. He won't be here long. And she took time to spend with Jesus. I can't tell you how many people have said to me as my children were growing up, don't miss it. Blink your eyes, they'll be grown. I heard it my whole life. Men at the end of their life, they, ne they never say, I wish I would have worked more. 
But I've heard many say, I wish I would have spent more time with the family. We're really good at saying this, hey, we need to get together. But not so good at following through. Hey, life is passing by. You know what you ought to give people? Time and attention. This week we had a young boy in our church and he has developmental issues. He's very um, sensitive to touch and other things and he had hurt his foot. And his mom took him, his name is Tommy, and took Tommy to Children's Hospital. And her husband is working, and you may know Jody. It's, it's, and uh, she's, a, she's a young lady who's like a niece to me and to my brother, like, like a niece. And she grew up in our church and doesn't have a dad. She says, I'm taking Tommy to the hospital, and I don't know how he's going to react if they have to put a cast on him. My brother called me and said, I'm going to meet her at the hospital. And this week on Thursday, he literally helped to hold this young man down, which is so sad. As the doctors lovingly wrestled with him and had to get this cast on his foot. And as he was there struggling and not understanding, why are they putting this on my foot? And again, his developmental issues and his mom standing there with tears streaming down her face. And my brother texted me and said, I'm not going to be at church for a while. This is taking longer than we thought. And then he helped her load the car and she went her way. And he said, I just sat down in my truck. He's like, I just wept. She deals with that every day. Listen to me. The husband, Tom and Jody, and they'll never forget this week that Charlie took the time to push off what he was doing and just show some love to them by giving time and attention. I remember I was listening to a Christmas special. Happened to be Christmas in the country. And some country musicians were talking about their favorite Christmas. My favorite Christmas is when I got this red bike. My favorite Christmas is when I got my ukulele. I thought, what? We don't do ukuleles in Philly, right? What, what are you doing? It's a little guitar, right? That was my favorite Christmas. They said, Hank Williams Jr., What's your favorite Christmas? And I was surprised they didn't cut it out, honestly. He said, I, I didn't really have any favorite Christmases. I'm like, humbug, right? What's going on? He's like, he said, this is what he said. He said, I used to get all the toys that every kid in the neighborhood wanted. I got full-size arcade machines. I got go-karts that were worth thousands. I got motorcycles. I, he said, I got everything. On Christmas afternoon, this is Hank Williams Jr., country music star. The kids would flood to my house to play with the presents that I got. And this is what he said, but all I wanted for Christmas was my father. That's what he said. And he was out singing to the world, Hank Williams Sr. And that boy said, I just want some time. Hey, while you have time, Give the people you love some time. And lastly, let me say this, we can express our love by showing our loyalty. You remember the soldiers came to arrest Jesus and the guy we talked about earlier who puts his foot in his mouth, Peter was there, took off his sword and cut off Malchus's ear. Remember that? Jesus put his ear back on his head, said, hey, Peter, no, no, it's not time for this. In that moment when things were rough for Jesus, you know who stepped up and expressed his love by showing his loyalty? It was Peter. Peter stood up for him. Folks, we've never lived in a more disloyal age than we live today. Hey, be loyal to your friends. Be loyal to your church. Be loyal to your pastors. Be loyal to your family. They're not perfect. When there's a problem, work it out. Right? When there's a situation, deal with it. But we are so quickly to be disloyal to each other. Hey, people remember when you stick by their side. I had a guy in our school named Dale, and Dale was a little bit academically slow and not the most athletic guy. And remember one day we were out in gym class. One of the coolest kids in the school, Todd, played third base. He was playing third base. Dale was up to bat. No, 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 no. Let's reverse that. Todd was up to bat. Dale was playing third base. And Todd said this. 
I'm going to hit the ball to you, Dale, because you stink. I was playing shortstop. I said, be quiet. No. Todd says, I won't be quiet. He stinks. He's one of the worst baseball players I've ever seen. And Dale, I'm going to hit the ball right to you because there's no way you'll field it. I said, be quiet. I won't be quiet. I'm playing shortstop. I said, leave him alone. I won't leave him alone. He stick. Do you ever get the tingling feeling like in your toes that starts to then go? How many of you know what I'm talking about? And you're like, it's coming, right? And that adrenaline rush. To, I remember I, I started, Pastor Folger, I was at shortstop. And I start to go toward. And then my walk turned into a jog and my jog into. I don't know if it's the wisest thing in the world to attack a guy who has a bat in his hand. All right. <laughs> but that's he's making fun. Of, I just had enough. Not long ago, I'm driving down the road, pulled out of my driveway, and I haven't seen this guy in years. Dale drives by me. Did you ever see someone do that? You hit the brakes, then you back up, and you're like, let's not hit each other. And the windows are coming down. I haven't seen Dale in years. He said to me, how are you doing? I said, good. I said, how are you, Dale? He said, I'm good. We talked for a moment, and I said, hey, I'll see you. It's good to talk to you. And he said, hey, this is what he said. I never forgot. I said, you never forgot what? He said, I never forgot that day on the baseball field. I wasn't even thinking about it. He said, thanks for being a friend. I said, I love you, man. I'll see you. And we drove away. This is years later. And you know what he associated with me? That expression of love that day. Church family, I believe we all have a lot of love in us. But here's the thing, it needs to come out of us. It needs to be expressed daily. That church in Thessalonica, it said the charity. And we define charity as expressed love. You guys are expressing love in an amazing way. You know, it'd be a wonderful thing if people walk into Cleveland Baptist Church and we all have a revival of expressing love, this will be a very attractive place. Give out our tracks. Share the gospel. Sing our song. Do it. Watch me. But let's not neglect what Jesus said was the greatest. Let's not neglect that. When you die, and you will, if Jesus doesn't come back, you listen to me, you're going to be remembered for one thing, and that's your expression of love. It's true. People will come, and they'll talk about how you impacted their life, or not. But that's the stuff that changes lives. God's pretty smart. What's the greatest commandment? Love God and love people. Amen. And when you sum it all up, that's what matters. The car you drove, the house you slept in, the vacation you may take, I hope you enjoy all of it. But when this thing is wrapped up, it's your expressions of love that matter. The greatest expression of love, I don't know who's here this morning, is this. The Bible says, greater love in John 15, 13, hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Greatest expression of love ever is when Jesus died for us. John 3, 16, you know it. I'm going to read it and actually put my eyes on it. The Bible says this, for God so loved the world. You know what? If the scriptures just said to us, God loves the world, I hope we'd believe it. But he said this, God so loved the world, watch, he expressed it. He didn't just knowledge, just say it, just declare it. He expressed it. You can't argue with that. For God so loved the world that he gave. 
He expressed it, His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you walk through these doors today and you don't have Jesus in your heart, you've not been saved, you don't know that heaven is your home, can I tell you, the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, loved you enough to go to a cross and paid for your sins and mine on a hill called Calvary. And he offers to you eternal life and forgiveness of your sins. If you've not received that, I beg you to receive it today. We had built a snowman in our front yard. The kids were young. Sticks for arms. Put a hat on it. Cookies or buttons or something for the nose. Carrot. Carrot for the nose. Right? Buttons down the front. For the eyes. After we built the snowman, we went across the street. We shoveled snow for a dear old lady in her late 80s. Mrs. Noecker. We're out there just shoveling away. And she could no doubt hear the... Right? Looks out her window. She sees us. Sees our house right across the street. We finish shoveling. We get up there by the door and she opens the door. Thank you for shoveling. My kids are there. We're just trying to love our neighbor. Thank you for shoveling. I don't know how all, I say this lovingly, old people have these. But she then handed us like a blue tin with all those little cookies that are in the doilies. You, you know what I'm talking about? I don't know if they were from last Christmas. I don't know if they're from five. Y'all have them. She handed us those and said, thank you for shoveling my walk. We said, Miss Noecker, you are welcome. We're happy to do it. Here's these cookies. And she looked over our shoulder and she said, oh, you built a snowman. Hold on. And the door shut, and we waited. She came back with a scarf. She went to hand the scarf, and my daughter, Kayla, who's the sweetest thing, better than the boys, no doubt. She said, oh, no, Mrs. Noecker. Oh, no. What? And I'm her dad, and in our house, boys are tough, and so are girls. Right? I went, mm, mm. And I elbowed Kayla. And she kind of looks at me. She's, oh, thank you, Miss Noecker. But she was saying, no, 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 we don't want your scarf. I'm like, Kayla, just take it. So then we turned. She's like, Daddy, I wasn't trying to be mean. I just didn't want her. Get. I said, listen, Kayla, when someone tries to express love to you, don't reject it. Amen. She's like, I understand. I understand. Folks, listen to me. Christ on the cross Love the world. If you don't know him, don't reject, reject the greatest expression of love ever. Today would be the day to say yes, thank you. And if you're his child today, you know what we all need to do? We need to love like Christ. And it can't just be inward. It must be expressed. And if it is, Lives will be changed. And I don't, you understand who I am and where I am. We need to speak Christ. I'm not for lifestyle evangelism only. You watch me hit a golf ball and then somehow you ask me about Jesus. No, watch me. I'm for both. But when our Savior was asked the greatest commandment, he said, love God and people. I'm leaving. You're staying. Stay down here and love people. It's the way they'll all know that you're my disciples. People walk through these doors and we're like the church at Thessalonica and love is abounding in this place. Watch me. It will bring people to Jesus. In your family, say it. Do it. People in your church family, express it. It's the way God wants us to live. Father, we love you. Thank you for this.